Hey guys, just a quick note before we begin that the show may contain spoilers and adult language, but that's just because we know how to have a good time. Stick around, you'll be glad you did. You are here for me to enlighten you. If you ever act like this again, you're barred for life. It's just vile and base. It's kind of embarrassing. If you know your lines, then you can forget them. Oh, I get it. It's very clever. <laughs> Hello, peoples, and welcome to Esoterica Cinema, the podcast where we take films from the cinematic multiverse and discuss the hell out of them. My name is Jason Peters, and with me, as always, is the man who insiders acknowledge taught Tom Cruise everything he knows about the Church of Scientology... Mr. Ryan Siebold! What's up, Jason? How's it going, buddy? Not bad, man. Not bad. Yeah, dude. Uh, really, uh, it was interesting because I didn't, I hadn't really done a deep dive on Scientology before. You know, it's funny because they have a whole bunch of those places out here. I know we've talked about it before. But uh, yeah, it turns out you had this whole past I didn't know about where you were like this close to becoming one of the King Dinglings. Uh, and then it didn't work out, so uh, they passed the torch to Tom, but uh, you coached him up, apparently. I mean, lucky for you, because uh brought me here to the podcast. But yeah, um, you know, I, I know you throw these things at me in the uh, the head of the show, and you try to trip me up, but a uh, little, little more truth to this one than you may uh, may actually realize here. Uh, Scientology, okay. right here in my own backyard in Clearwater, Florida, and Tom Cruise uh, lives here part-time, as does John Travolta. Uh, has a house up in Ocala, Florida, just north of here. So uh, they are here doing their Scientology business all the time. And uh, yeah, we have crossed paths before, me and Tom. I have photo evidence mm. of said thing. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and I talked to some I talked to some people that were like pretty up there in the uh, hierarchy, if you will. And, and yeah, I mean, they, you know, they're like, you can't put it out there. I mean, you know, you guys in your shitty podcast can't really do anything for the church. And that hurt for a minute. But once I got over that, I understood what they were saying. So but yeah, dude, uh, it was like I said, something that I didn't know about at all about you. And uh, very interesting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, he saw me at a um in a back alley one time, there was a couch there and I remember being frustrated. It was a really rough day and I was like, just, I had had enough and I was jumping on the couch um, and, <laughs> and he was passing by and he said, Hey, what, what are you doing over there? And, and I said, I'm really mad. I'm jumping on this couch. And uh, so we got to talking and, and yeah, I, I was able to show him some things, show him my form. And, and then we got to talking a little bit about the, <laughs> the church of Scientology and I got to, um, you know, kind of be a missionary of sorts and, and lead him into uh, into the fold. Uh, it all worked out. Wow. Um, I, so did you like guys, did you guys like sit there and like practice different poses on the couch? Like I assume this was prior to his infamous <laughs> Oprah. It was very correct? much. Yeah, it was a long time before Oprah. Right. This was. Uh, yeah. And so that's why, you know, it, it's kind of like one of those muscle memory things like. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, you know, but if you're mad and you know it, jump on a couch. It just works. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever tried it, but we, I mean, I haven't since I was two and a half, but you know, you sold me. I might have to try it's, it. It's good for any emotion, really. If you're really happy about something or if you're really mad about something, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean that's that's usually the way I take it. So this is why this is why everybody complains that my furniture isn't comfortable, huh? Someone's <laughs> jumping. Right you got to break it in with your feet. <laughs> No, no, no. Oh, that's what it is. Break it in. I was just breaking it. Yeah, don't ah, do that. Stupid me. Don't do that. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, Ryan, you have a description for our film this week. Why don't you go ahead and give our listeners a little clue as to what's going on? I do. From 1979, we're diving into the embryonic sack of fun that is the brood from David Cronenberg. <laughs> <laughs> IMDb has this. As a man tries to uncover an unconventional psychologist therapy techniques on his institutionalized wife amidst a series of brutal murders committed by a brood of mutant children. Oh boy, Jason, this was, uh, this was something, um, <laughs> as is, uh, the case every week. I will ask you once more, Jason, what did you think about this movie? As always, Ryan, I'm going to be happy to tell you right after we listen to this trailer for David Cronenberg's. The Brood. They come from the unknown, 
And they're here now, hiding, waiting to strike. You can feel their presence all around you. <clears throat> Never before have you come this close to the edge of terror. Never before have you faced anything so strange and sinister, so bizarre and unnerving. Never until now. David Cronenberg's The Brood. Are you ready for me, Frank? I seem to be a very special person now. I'm in the middle of a strange adventure. I want to go with you wherever you go. Do you? Then look! The Brood. You can run. You can hide and hope they won't find you. But you won't escape. Once unleashed, The Brood will destroy anyone who gets in their way. David Cronenberg's ultimate experience in inner terror. Starring Oliver Reed and Samantha Egger. The Brood. They're waiting for you. All right, Ryan. Now you ask me what I thought of this movie. I will tell you, meh. Thought it was okay. Yeah. I have a feeling you probably didn't like it. Maybe you disliked it a little more than I did. I have a feeling uh, of that know, too. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those things where I was like, ah, yeah, I don't think he's digging this over there on the other side of the coast. Uh, and look, there's a handful of things about it that would come to be David Cronenberg hallmarks. And like, you know, it's a lot of the just, just practical effects and whatnot were super cool to see. But like, it was definitely, you know, we've talked about this on this film. A lot of time we were, we look at different filmmakers first films and sometimes, you know, somebody's got a preternatural ability where they're just like coming out the gate strong. But some of them, you know, they're still trying to find their footing. I think this was definitely one of those finding his footing films. I am kind of surprised, to be honest, that. Criterion selected it uh, to be remastered as part of their collection. Yeah, me too. Um, I was wondering about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah, what about what about you, man? Yeah, same. This was like so. Th I think this was his, you know, third or maybe fourth feature film, and he had really? done some television as well. Yeah, nothing of note. Oh, uh, wow. There's nothing that I would like point you to. <laughs> mm. um, but yeah, I think he had made other films before this. This so this kind of falls in that territory, right? Of like. Uh, Peter Jackson's Dead Alive or Brain Dead uh, that we covered earlier this season, where you know he had made a couple films before that as well. Peter Jackson did, and then he landed on Dead Alive. But Dead Alive was fun as shit, and then this movie was just kind of like so dry. I was yeah. bored the whole time. <laughs> yeah, it was really like kind of a flat film. It didn't really uh, feel like it needed to ever kind of pick it up above five or six. Yeah, and. You know, there's also here and I'll, and I'll be quite upfront, too, is that, uh, you know, this film is is at least half like a divorce film, you know. Right. And one of the one of the problems that I have typically with divorce films is that, like, it's kind of hard to take an original look at that situation. Like it, it tends to, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's, you know, it's one of, one of a handful of things, right. Is like, it's often infidelity. Okay. So immediately like one person's got the power over the other and the other person's trying to justify what they did. Um, or it's just kind of a, a natural falling out, which uh, I know I don't look things up, you know, very often, but one thing I did want to see is like, okay, I get the sense that Cronenberg was kind of working through a divorce through this let me just check that real quick and sure enough he was he was and yeah in my brief research apparently the divorce itself was was pretty okay but then they had like a really nasty custody battle over their dog over the brood uh, right <laughs> yeah yeah so again like some pretty uh pretty comparable notes going on here from uh, what was going on in his personal life and what made it over into the script we're gonna go ahead and take a look at that here and uh as always ryan we're gonna go ahead and start where at the beginning, yeah. 
Absolutely. So when we open the brood, we open on an OTS looking at the face of a rather large man. This man is all shaved face and serious features. He speaks to another man who we can immediately tell is of a meek demeanor, short curly hair, and the large man curses him for not looking him in the eye when he speaks. He indicates that this is the behavior reflective of a weak man. Now, what's interesting is behind them, the background is pitch black, so it gives us really no sense of space as we begin the film, setting up what we hope is going to be a consistent sense of uncertain dread. Now, Ryan, unfortunately, I don't think the film kind of keeps that up, and it sounds like you don't either. From there, we do have the camera pivoting. We see that this guy, this sort of, again, meek, curly-haired individual, is referring to the other man as daddy, and we can sort of immediately tell very quickly that there's some sort of psychological aspect to what's going on right and uh we also get this from the sense that the camera backs up cuts to a wide shot and we see that there's an audience in this sort of like observation room that is watching this what initially i thought was a performance but then came to realize was a sort of interview that's yeah that's what i thought it looks like a little stage or something like he's doing a little uh two-man act and then the the lights even go down at the end like and scene <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I thought maybe Absolutely. they were, I don't know, playing a camera. I was like, I was trying to wrap my head around that. Like, is this real? Because I, I, I mean, obviously you go into this knowing who David Cronenberg is and what you're probably going into. We've already discussed yeah. Videodrome at length last season. And so, uh, and then of course I'm familiar with some of his other films as well. Not the least of which is like The Fly and, you know, some of his more well-known stuff. So um, you kind of know uh, Scanners, you know, stuff like that. So you kind of know a little bit yeah. about what's probably coming and I think that was my problem is like it never really came right. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was a few things Yeah, yeah, yeah. towards the end, especially, I mean, it got bananas towards the sure. end, but a uh, huge payoff and that was dope. But you know, everything leading up to that, I will also say that this movie is only an hour and a half. Yes. So it's, it's not in and out. It's not going to waste your time. He keeps things moving along at the very least so that if you're not into it, Hey, you're uh, no, no huge skin off our back. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Now. And here's the other thing, dude. I mean, neither of us are psychologists. Go figure right yeah. with our amazing insight into human behavior. Uh, so I, you know, it could very well be that something like this takes place or used to take place in terms of observation of these different interviews because really it was no different than the uh, surgery observations, right? We, we, we see that and we know that all the time where, uh, you know, those really tall uh, rooms and, and people sit around at the top and they watch a surgeon perform surgery, right? This was essentially the same thing, but instead of watching a physical doctor or a surgeon, they're watching a psychologist. So I don't know if that is a construct that was made specifically for this film or if that's an actual thing that goes on there. I'm sure we have a bunch of really intelligent psychologists and psychiatrists that listen to our dumb asses on this show. So, guys, why don't you go ahead and reach out to us? I mean, Let us know what's going on. If is we this do, something they're probably that very... Do you guys watch weird shit go down from <laughs> other doctors? Hit us up, esotericacinema at gmail.com or Twitter. What you got, Ryan? Uh, I mean, if they if they do, they're probably very concerned. That's all I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they use us for case studies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're listening to this right now in a giant room. Hello, everyone listening. Lots of pause, Thank rewind, you. and playback. Yeah, now let's listen to it again. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So, yeah, and, uh, and, and one of the things is, you know, it was kind of interesting, at least. I mean, you know, say what you will about whatever's going on in this opening scene. It does at least kind of pull you in more than the entire middle of the film, I would argue. You know, I was at least interested in figuring out what was going on. Well, yeah. And there, there's two things to derive from this opening sequence, too, which is, number one, the patient of sorts. So you got two people on stage, a doctor and a patient. We find out later the patient is calling the doctor daddy over and over again. And he's in a subservient mindset of sorts and confessing yeah. things to daddy. Uh, in a very creepy kind of way, really, uh, if I do. <laughs> totally. And also that he's got <laughs> um, like lesions all over his body. Yes. Is revealed as we pull back. And those are two things that are going to pay off later. We'll find out more about that. But uh, it, it is worth mentioning that there's a little foreshadowing right here in the very opening shot. Absolutely. Absolutely. So after that, we do see that our protagonist, Frank, is in the audience of people that are observing this interview going on, let's say. 
And uh, from there, Frank goes to pick up his daughter from school. He gets home. That's where he notices wounds on her body as well. And so he starts taking pictures and, you know, we're not 100 percent sure what's going on. Soon find out that he's estranged from his wife. And he goes uh, we find this out as he goes to visit his wife at a psychiatric hospital, which was called Soma Free. I thought that was kind of funny. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Soma, obviously, I think I think so. Soma, I think, was from Brave New World first. And then like actual Somas came out referencing that. Oh, that I did not know. Yeah, yeah, because Soma's the Soma's the drug in Brave New World that they they feed everyone. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's also like a downer and like a so it's very similar. But anyway, so I don't I don't think the drug Soma existed as a as a medicine at the time this movie was made. So I'd assume it's a reference to the book. Yeah, I think they were but all taking regardless. Quaaludes back then. I think we were on Quaaludes at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not Quail qu- what Quail free, Quaalude free. No, no, it's Quay yeah. free, Quaf free. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, uh, they meet to discuss the daughter's wounds. The dad is concerned that the mother's responsible. She's seeing her on the weekends at this, I guess, at the hospital because the mom doesn't leave. That's weird. It doesn't really seem like anybody gets admitted here, but whatever. And either way, he's trying to talk to his wife. Uh, There's this the the primary doctor uh, that uh, is going to be something of an antagonist, I suppose, throughout the most of the film, even though he's not really by the end of it. Uh, but anyways, you know, he's not gonna, he's not gonna let her, or rather he's not gonna let him talk to her. So from there we go inside and we meet the woman that they're talking about, the wife and mom, who is Nola. And she's engaged in this weird sort of role play with the doctor where he's sort of playing her mom and she's talking to him as her mom, discussing some of the past abuses that they used to have. And, uh, one of the things that kind of interests me out of the gate, Ryan, is we'll, we'll, we'll sort of table this whole thing for a second. We'll come back to it. I was really interested by the overall visual aesthetic of the film. Now, before I give you my insight, was there anything about it that sort of uh, popped out to you or that you noticed in particular? Um. Okay. Uh, to me, it kind of seemed like an ABC after school special a little bit. It seemed like, uh, you know, so, that late seventies, early eighties, but almost like it almost looked like the Incredible Hulk with Bill Bixby. The way it was lit and shot, it had a very like dreamy look to it. Um, mm-hmm. what what were you thinking? Yeah, kind of kind of along those lines. So one of the things that struck me about this film is if you look at the, it's not even really so much the photography itself so much as it's the production value, but this is a very bright and colorful film. I'll go and with that. Yeah. Very interesting. Sure. Because like most of the times, you know, a, a, a sort of, if it's not an outright horror, you know, some people call it a body horror. I think it's more, it's fair probably more so to call it a, a dramatic thriller is probably what I would call this film. That's how I would classify this film. And again, so when you, when we see a lot of the different elements, again, there's this very vibrant color. So one of the first instances where this really sprung out to me was when he go, he does actually end up going inside the uh, protagonist, Frank, that is, to talk to the doctor. And he's basically got one of these, you know, wide open offices where it's just all like uh, floor to ceiling windows and outside. So it, the, the, the film takes place in Canada. You know, uh, Cronenberg's a Canadian filmmaker. And one thing you notice is that instead of being white, like the entire exterior is blue, almost like they put blue gels out, though. I'm sure they just didn't correct for the outside. Yeah, for uh, daylight, right. You know, exactly, yeah. So it's like this bright blue. And then when we go to the school, which we're going to go to very quickly, we see that there's a ton of color around everywhere there, right? Whether it's the colorful outfits of the school children in their snow gear, whether it's colorful papers that are hung up all over the place. When we go into, for example, the grandma's house, even her house, there's a lot of greens and there's a lot of color everywhere. So it's just really funny because typically a film that is presented in this manner, um, if first of all, it's going to be shot more like a noir film where it's going to be really dark, lots of shadows. And then if it does have color, it's going to do it in that sort of like, uh, you know, sort of a neo-noir, almost Blade Runner-ish way, you know, where it's sort of the 
dark neon lights used sparingly against sort of black, but this doesn't. Like I said, everything's very bright. Most of the film takes place during the day, which is very interesting. Yeah, I thought so too. And I did notice that part. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought it was just kind of very interesting decisions to uh, so, sort of eschew what would be traditional horror tropes with regard to how you're shooting it. My take on that was very simply and very quickly that this is a case of bringing the uh, bringing the horror into the nuclear family, not bringing the nuclear family into the horror. So, so often, you know, like uh, Poltergeist, for example, you're going to bring that family into the horror place. And so they go into the night um, and, and oh, you know, yeah, 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 all of that. Saying. But this is bringing the horror to them. So it's their turf. Nice. And that's kind of a different fear altogether, right? Like, at that point, you're not anywhere you're not supposed to be. It's on your turf, and it's kicking your ass, and that's kind of its own thing, right? So that's kind of – he kind of um, uh, approached it from a, a different way, which I thought was interesting. So I did kind of follow what you were saying, yeah. Yeah, definitely, no, and that's uh, and that's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah, because, you know, they're – I mean, you. I don't think you're going to say that at this point in time their life is idyllic by any means. No, no, but no, right. They do stu- – they, they are still living a version of the suburban dream and – yeah, but these know, uh, these I'm, mutant kids, which we're going to get to shortly, uh, which is when the action takes place. When when think when people start getting whacked, they're getting whacked on their own turf in broad daylight. You see, yeah, the brood. Uh, you know, they're not uh, hidden by shadows in any way, shape, or form, and they're wearing like bright Saturday morning cartoon, like a Christmas story style snow jackets. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all very bright orange, bright red, bright blue, just like you would see, uh, you know, in a Christmas story. It was pretty funny. Absolutely. Absolutely. So shortly thereafter, we get our sort of first taste of like, I don't know, we'll just call it like Cronenberg weird shit, right? And that's kind of one of the hallmark of his films. Dude. He's, he's always like, hey, I'm going to throw some weird shit in here for you. So we get that where. The daughter is at home and she's being watched by the grandma. And then there's like a small door that looks like it was one of like something that was used to deliver like milk and OJ like back in the 50s out here anyways. I don't know if they still fucking do that up there. Canada wouldn't surprise me, right? Crazy Canadians. milk, here to go. They probably just put the cow udders right through that door and you could just fill it yourself (laughs) (laughs) like a Coke machine. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> there's a there's a guy named Steve that just walks around with a cow every morning. Yeah, and, you know the people come out and bring their buckets. You get a yeah, you get a teat through the <laughs> through the door and and you <laughs> squeeze it right in your cereal and you're good to go. <laughs> We're so fucking ignorant. <laughs> uh, this is how I picture fantastic. Canada. Is it like that? <laughs> is it like that? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Without no, nobody correct us on this. Just to, nobody correct us. We know that it's like this. Uh, it's some this version it of, is. I don't know, like brain. 1927's Alaska, but uh, I'll ignore all the I'll ignore all the screenshots of uh, skyscrapers that I see in Toronto. Yeah. Drake who? Because <laughs> it doesn't vibe with this joke. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so anyway, hey, if I've yeah. offended any of our audience, I just like to uh, sincerely say I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They were never upset at you, Ryan. We didn't have any never. listeners. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so there's, uh, you know, that door, whatever that is, and it starts like thumping and shaking and sort of vibrating and like something's about to break in, right? But it's obviously kind of a small door, so it can't be a person. And from there, we've got these items that are flying off the shelves in the kitchen. Obviously, Grandma hears it. She goes to investigate, and she's attacked by a very small person. It could be a kid. We haven't really seen the face at this point, so we're, we, we we don't know that they're disfigured yet. And the small person has a mallet from the kitchen, which mallets seem to be their preferred uh, weapon of choice. And they beat the crap out of the grandma, kill her, and that's when the little girl Candace comes into the kitchen to find the body, looks up to this sort of staircase that's there, Or maybe it's just the ceiling. I wasn't sure. Either way, there's the kid who's sort of up in the corner or whatever. And that's when we get a glimpse of that disfigured face uh, before it cuts to the next scene. Ryan, let me just ask you, what did you think of the creature design and these creatures as the sort of overall threat? Like, did it work for you? Did you buy in? No, I didn't. It it didn't work for me. And I didn't buy in. They didn't seem very... um, they didn't really seem like formidable foes. I mean, obviously they were being played by children with heavy makeup on their face, but 
you know, they're again, they're they're wearing like, you know, these heavy snow jackets that aren't very maneuverable for starters. If you've ever worn one again, there was a whole bit about it in the Christmas story, um, which I guess makes this a Christmas movie, which is great for our uh, holiday episode season <laughs> here. <laughs> we haven't oh, even this, said happy awesome. holidays this can to everybody, be a- but anyways. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this can be the next, like, uh, is it a Christmas film or isn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. right. So, so- <laughs> it was like Die Hard at first, and then it was Gremlins, now The Brood. So they weren't very formidable foes. Uh, Graham Graham was straight up kicking back J and B scotch and OJ. I don't know if you noticed it, <laughs> this, but uh, I have in my notes, she like steadily held on to a glass of each. She had a scotch in one hand and an OJ in the other. And uh, neither <laughs> one left her hand the whole way down to the ground as she was being massacred. So I thought that was brilliant. Um, Listen, Ryan, someone could make an argument that any situation in life can be better dealt with, with either a, a cocktail or B orange juice. Uh, Depending on the nature of the situation, one of those two is going to help you out. <laughs> Touche. Does, is this situation right now included? Because if so, I'll be right back. <laughs> and I'm all out of OJ. I think in this situation, it's both of them, right? You need some OJ to, to get the blood pumping and you need some scotch to just right, like, right. deal with some weird shit. Hey, you know, I mean, what happens when you get blood drawn? They give you OJ. And this this Graham Graham got her blood drawn all over the floor, so I guess it's uh, fitting. Um, yeah, but yeah, the the kid thing, you know, they have these little mallets, like they're um, elves building toys for Santa Claus. It's like the the, the it's like the the mallets <laughs> the doctors use to test your yeah. knee reflex, <laughs> and they're supposed I mean, to be like formidable. At least get like a ball peen hammer or something that I'm like gonna. <laughs> I don't know. The whole thing just looked, and I think maybe that's when I stop taking this movie more like less serious because yeah. up until this point, I, I, again, I've seen Cronenberg's other work. I knew where this was going to go in some way, shape or form. And I was on board for it. I was really looking forward to this film uh, in all fairness. And, uh, yeah, same, and dude. I think that's maybe where, and it's not a bad movie. I'm not going to, if I'm coming across it's negative, it's not a bad film. I think, uh, I, I just expected more perhaps. out of it. I think I wanted more out yeah, of it. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, disappointing, but not bad. Yeah, yeah. It was just one of those deals. So, anyways, totally. Yeah, no, I literally don't have anything because I had never seen this that. movie just, before. Uh, Cinematic Confession. I actually saw this film once, but it was ten years ago on the low end, fifteen to twenty on the high end. Okay, and it was funny because I actually remember I liked it much better the first time around, and I don't know if you know what's really funny. I liked this. Much better the first time I saw it than right now. And I actually liked Videodrome much more when we looked at it in season one than the first time I saw it, which again was 10 to 15 years ago. Okay. Um, so a little flip flop. Yeah. So yeah, flip flopped. Exactly. So, but, uh, but yeah, so from there, Frank goes to visit. And now I wasn't a hundred percent sure, Ryan, if this was like a friend of his, I think it was maybe a reference from the doctor, at the Soma Free Hospital, but it's basically the guy who he goes to see that's got, like, the wicked comb over, and he describes everything about the psychoplasmics and kind of informs us as the audience, and like he's in, like, a, a psych hospital. He's the fellow with the uh, the towel around his neck, right? With the uh, yeah, yeah, with the yeah, gobbler. Exactly. We end up seeing him with, he's got, like, a yes, sir. turkey gobbler on his neck. Happy Thanksgiving, Correct, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. Uh, yeah. And I believe it's sort of supposed to be like a psych ward. And I believe the doctor referred him there to talk to him about sort of what was going on. But uh, yeah. And that's where he kind of uh, informs us that this doctor is experimenting with this thing known as psychoplasmics, which I believe is maybe a play on psychotropics. It's right there. Either way, so psycho. Stop right there. Was this ever ex- <laughs> okay? <laughs> Was this ever explained this psychoplasmics bullshit? It, and no, and that, and that's one of the problems that I have with this film is like it's it's the impetus for everything that's going on, and it's really like. Yeah, he does not take the time to explain it out. I can only imagine he didn't take the time, Cronenberg, that is, to actually flesh it out and figure out flesh exactly it out. what it is it. himself. Ah. Hey. <laughs> but um but yeah so without knowing exactly what it is and what these things do and what they're trying look i mean they they make a quick reference to the fact that apparently something about these psychoplasmics the doctor believes is the key to unlocking the mind's ability to move past some sort of trauma right 
So it's it's ultimately, I guess, in its weird way, it's kind of like one of those uh, cure for wellness things, right? Like, oh yeah, I'm trying to unlock the secret to blah blah blah, and but again, it's just it's not gone into what exactly they are, how they work, what they're trying to achieve. Really, really. But lazy. is it a drug? So it's a drug that he's giving them. Then it's a it's a, a tangible thing that's causing this. I don't even know that because we never really or see or is it like a process it or administering it to them i i would and that's what i was saying because you know uh, i would i would have to imagine it's a physical drug but uh, you know again because it's there are causing body you ask me to imagine and certain things that you shouldn't this is something you should at least just show us a fucking pill bottle with them popping it once or twice right something me a or if it's bone. not that yeah if it is just an entirely mental thing like show one of them undergoing the mental training or psychological training or breaking down whatever you want to call it like just just tell us what it is so we can jump on board man like i'm trying to meet you halfway here but you're, you're asking a lot right and so here's my problem is it seems to have different effects to all these different people. So it's like the, okay. this doctor's like claim to fame, more or less. It's how what he's doing or, or doing test trials of it on these folks, right? So in the opening sequence, you have the the fella on stage with the the he's got like seeping uh lesions on his body or or you know uh, some kind of chicken pox looking something all over his body with his, because yeah. his shirt's off. We didn't even mention that. Sure. Um, and so we see all over his skin. Um, and then this guy in the, now that where we're at in the film currently, he takes the towel, he's wearing a towel around his neck and he's talking about suing the doctor because of all the negative effects that came from the psycho, whatever the fucks. And yeah. he removes the towel at the end of their conversation to demonstrate wh- how bad it's gotten physically for him and why this man, uh, our, our protagonist should go get his wife out of there. And when when he does, we see that he's got like almost like mushroom spores or something growing. Yeah, some weird off gizzard of his neck. thing like hanging out his neck. Yeah, 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 it was disgusting. And it was on stage for you know on screen for a minute. Uh, then he covers it back up. Typical Cronenberg shit. And then sure. you know by the oh, end, typical Cronenberg before he has Rick Baker. Let's okay, specify. that's also <laughs> fair. That's actually a very very good point, and maybe why we didn't see more of this stuff throughout the film, and why I was bored. Yeah. Um, getting yeah. to the end of the film, not to spoil anything or, or cut to the chase, but we see a much different effect to uh to the woman. So I'm just kind of yes. curious, like well, if all this was caused by the psychotropic whatever the fucks, or if it's Well yeah, it was. So and that and that was so that's that's part of it is that it's not very consistent. Well no, so so this is part Side of it. Side effects so may include everything <laughs> <laughs> so what it is is this doctor is trying to basically come up with this breakthrough research using these psychoplasmics. Now even though we don't necessarily know what they are He's basically experimenting with different people. So the thing is, like, this is sort of like his clinical trial for this specific form of treatment. Again, known as psychoplasma. Oh, so shit, that's, dude. This is like yes. Dr. Fauci with the COVID vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> you and I were test subjects. Ah, no. a, that explains this growth <laughs> on my dick. I was wondering what that was. I thought it was from last spring break. Uh, totally <laughs> has to do with the vaccine. That's my story, and I'm sticking uh, to it. No take backs. I've always had six inch diameter balls, but that's just me. <laughs> Have I got a club <laughs> for you, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> but no, so that's the thing. So, and that's kind of so, and that kind of is why the doctor is so like slavishly devoted to this woman is basically he's tried using all of these other experimental figures, all of these other test patients, and nothing's working with him. You can't get the results he's looking for. And this Nola chick all of a sudden is responding in the way that he's looking for. Now, how and why and everything like that remains again it's not explained but he's getting the results that he's looking for from nola and from no one else which is why he basically uh, stops treating everyone else so he throws that guy out he says i'm not going to treat you anymore okay does the same thing with all of the rest of his patients he's whittled it is down now to exclusively the focused right. on her because she can prove what he's been trying to demonstrate this whole time uh, we're going to put a pin in that and I'm going to come back to it later when we get to the <laughs> okay. woman. Got it. Okay. So, yeah. So, and then, uh, you know, shortly after that, we've got another sort of death scene and, and then they're all very similar just in that people get bludgeoned to death. 
I think there's three of them, and it's all the same thing. So in the first one, it's the mallet. This time, it's these uh, paperweights, you know, like the uh, sort of snow globey paperweights that you have. Usually they're acrylic or glass, and they've got something pretty inside, and they sit on your desk. And so, yeah, it's uh, this grandpa. He basically shows up much like the protagonist, Frank, and I believe it's her dad. It is. And he wants, yeah, and he wants to talk to his daughter. And once again, the doctor won't let him talk, but he's drunk off his ass. So he goes back home, sobers up, calls back. He's like, hey, really sorry, doc, blah, blah, blah. And He's all upset uh, because his know, ex-wife, a.k.a. Nola's mom, just got brutally murdered by a you know, yeah. small munchkin. So, um, yeah, now it's his turn. Well, yeah. <laughs> so he's drinking, you know, to kind of console himself. And he's trying to investigate to find out what the hell happened and he's try to you know talk to his tell his daughter that her mother just passed away and the doctor won't let him so yeah he goes back i think to their old shared house that they used to live in yeah, together so or well. whatnot mm-hmm. and uh yeah then he gets whacked by another violent munchkin yeah yeah and like i said you know they use the sort of snow globe paperweights and and just sort of bludgeon him to death and yeah it's always a bludgeon. shortly after like a very yeah, slow yeah. like easily escapable death i think it seemed like i could get away from that it didn't seem like anything i should be concerned with everybody just kind of stands <laughs> there right like there's a a bit of a sergio leone yeah, style especially standoff. Those stupid uh kindergarten kids come on kids do something about right it. Right. There's a <laughs> there's a whole classroom and then two of these dudes, you know, these little kids are the brood or whatever. And they're holding hammers. I get it. But like, I feel like I could take two of those kids. <laughs> How many of those kids do you think you could take, Jason? Uh, of the brood at once? Uh, I would say six. Six. OK. Yeah. I, I feel solid against my chances. At six I think that's where my threshold is, too. I'm going to go with six on that. Yeah. <laughs> so anything less than six all of a sudden doesn't seem very, uh, you know. Yeah, that you big know, a deal two anymore. of them, I got that. You know, two, two of them going to town on me with uh, some Lincoln logs. I think right. I can take that. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, before that scene, we do have the uh, autopsy scene, which I'm just a sucker for colored gels. I love the fact that it was shot entirely in purple and there was no good Fantastic. reason for them to do yep. that. I did notice that as well, and I loved it. I appreciate it. I mean, it's hard that. not to notice it. It's very <laughs> dramatic. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. That's kind of what I, what I spoke to earlier, where it's like, you know, normally you don't get this much color in a film like this. I mean, say what you will about the film itself. It's just it was a it was interesting to see this type of story be told with so much color. Yeah. So, and then there we learn that, you know, something's kind of amiss with these creatures because they don't have... Tra- something's amiss! hey oh, go figure. Uh, something, they don't have traditional sex organs and they don't have belly buttons. So, it, it's assumed that they are not traditionally birthed. Now, Ryan, I w- again, I know this is kind of factor into the end, so we're going to save that sort of, you know, conversation for the end. One thing we haven't talked about yet is the nature of the performances. So, uh, I mean, I mean, I won't even ask you. So, let's, let's, let's not sit here and pick apart the uh, seven-year-old girl's performance. What did you think of the protagonist, Frank, and then the mom, Nola, and then the doctor? Let's whittle it down to those three performances. Um, uh, Suitable. Uh, I thought they did okay. I thought the uh, Nola did, uh, the, the, the actress that played Nola did very well. What's her name? Samantha Eggers or Absolutely. something like that? Um, yeah. Yeah, I thought she did a fantastic job. Uh, you know, Frank was suitable. I don't think he was. Uh, it was a bad performance whatsoever. I also only think there there was so much, uh, only so much they could work with on film. You know, there was only so much going yeah. on in these scenes. There was a lot of dialogue talking about it, but not a lot of being about it. You know, there wasn't a lot of action. See, I agree with you. I think the mom did a great job, but I really feel like uh, this this old this Frank guy just left a lot on the table, man. I mean, I, I get and look. Here's the you inherently have a sort of difficulty when you do have a more restrained protagonist, right? Um, Because they don't get those showy moments. They don't get to emote very much, you know. But I think that it's a fine line, you know, playing the sort of Humphrey Bogart, cool guy. Like, not like cool guy the way that, like, hey, cool guy, right? But, like, in terms of he doesn't get riled up a lot. Um, Right, he's very in control of his emotions. Yeah, keeps his cool, exactly. And and I think that in sort of that neo-noir fashion, which I know a lot of people sort of ascribe that quality to Cronenberg's style of filmmaking anyways it just it, the performance felt flat for me it just a lot of this movie felt flat and dull uh, you know and I think that in keeping with that this main performance was both flat and dull as well right. and I get that he was supposed to be a little bit subdued but 
you know, where the line is between being subdued and uninteresting is. I mean, I'm not a professional actor. I can't tell you that, but it, well, th- with that the didn't shit work that was me. happening in the, in the, uh, threat, the imminent threat that was, um, closing in on his family, namely his daughter, um, and his ex-wife, I guess, uh, he doesn't seem very concerned. He's just kind of like, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like, man, it's on his list <laughs> of things to do, but it's not at the top. Like he, you know, he's going to go yeah. do some other stuff well, first. And, you know, and then when he's talking to people, he's like, yeah. I, I, oh, one more thing. You know, it's always like, like a, a little add on or a postscript where he's like, oh, and also did I mention that uh, there's these mutant children going around? <laughs> there's even a line in here where uh, a throwaway line where it's um, explained I think it was by uh, the doctor, in fact, where he's like, uh, they were trying to figure out, you know, what this was all about. And he's like, my guess is it's uh, some deformed kid that was kept in an attic. Wouldn't be yeah. the first time. Yeah, I remember that line. Yeah, so some yeah. embarrassed mother uh, probably is keeping her deformed kid up in the attic. So the uh, And it probably got out and ran away so that, uh, you know, <laughs> they, they, nobody has to see her embarrassed child that's deformed and a mutant. And, and, and then they said it wouldn't be the first time. And I was like, man, what kind of town is this? <laughs> Feeding their kid buckets of fish. It reminded me of that Treehouse of Horror episode with the Bart. With Absolutely. Mark I was just thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, man. Uh, oh, and then also yeah, you know, to your point uh, on the same token here, one thing I have in my notes is that the music is way more dramatic than what's going on in this film. Oh yeah. Did you notice oh, no. that? How are it? I did. And, you know, we talked about it during Videodrome that, like, this is Howard Shore because Howard Shore scored it every is. Cronenberg film. Lord of the Rings zone, Howard Shore. Yeah. And he's crushing it. <laughs> exactly. And you can tell that this man showed up to impress. He was like, <laughs> Mr. Cronenberg, yep. you have made a fantastic decision and I am not going to make sure that you don't regret this. Thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> Cracks knuckles gets to work. He was an overachiever on this one. <laughs> Absolutely. I almost yeah, wondered if he like, was like, <laughs> does he know he's scoring this movie? Did they show him the film? Right? Or did they just ask him well, to like put it, give him probably, some canned shit. And they just like dropped it They probably it in. isolated them. And he just went back and he's like, you know, going flurry thousand miles a minute, <laughs> staying up 20 hours a day, you know, comes back all excited with a giant like manila folder stuffed with papers. Like, Hey guys, how's it been going for you? <laughs> You. And they're like, what, what What do you have? He's like, I got all the musical score. What about you guys? Like like, like Rick Moranis and Ghostbusters. <laughs> Just, <laughs> oh, well, I got all this music. Can we go over all it? All over like, eager. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, I love that. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, no, dude. I mean, honestly, like he crushed it. Honestly, the score was honestly one of my favorite parts of the film. And, and it like just, I said, it was by contrast, like, though, it made the movie you tell that this dude more. was into it. <laughs> it did kind of, yeah, it did kind of show that like, you know, a lot of other people weren't really trying that hard, but it also brings up another aspect. This is one of the things that I really dislike about a lot of these divorce films that like, like we sort of talked about at the top of the show, which is that so often we, it sort of gets into this place. And by the way, this could be a very interesting note if it was explored appropriately but I don't think it was here but so often it really feels like the things that they're quote doing for their kid like they're actually more interested in attacking the other spouse than they are defending or taking care of their kid right right so like you know like multiple times he's like taking pictures of like her legions and her bruises and you know that he's doing that so he can like take those pictures to the judge and try to get sole custody and like again like you really don't get the sense that he's like as concerned about his daughter's welfare as he is in punishing his spouse and you get that sense a lot of those well, times. Well because he's doing very little to keep it from happening again. He's doing a lot to create a legal case. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so again, you know, and you, and you see that in a lot of these divorced films where it just gets to a point and then it's just, it takes an already ugly situation and it makes it uglier. And, and look, I mean, you know, we've, we've sat in some very ugly films, right? And ugly films can be very interesting when they're explored appropriately, but don't take an ugly film and make it dull along the way. Cause that's the worst of both worlds, right. dude. You know what I mean? Like, 
<laughs> I mean, in all fairness, so, uh, you know, I'm giving this one a mulligan because we all know where Cronenberg ended up and what he gave us. This isn't like, I hope he goes on to do something good because I really like that Cronenberg <laughs> kid. Uh, no, he went places and he gave us classics and bangers. And yeah, I love me sure. some Cronenberg. And so me too. Um, you know, uh, we're giving it. So he learned some stuff on this, you know, just in the same way, like we said earlier, that Pete Jackson was learning on. Dead Alive or Brain Dead uh, in the opening of this season, but that movie was fun. That movie was entertaining. Yeah, I love that movie to death. This movie, not so much. Oh, sure. Same, same. And you know, so from uh, from there, we do have the scene where you know Candace goes back to school, and then that's when we have the two troll kids disguise themselves. They end up grabbing the wooden mallet, and in front of all the students, just beat the teacher to death once again. It's a bludgeoning, but even the way that just. You know, I mean, they really could have used... So this is one thing that I thought was interesting. I think you'll agree with me, which is that on top of all the other elements, for as interesting as the musical score was and for as hard as Howard Shore tried on the score, whoever did the sound design couldn't be bothered to show up to work, dude. <laughs> there is like zero sound design. Yes. I swear there's there's so many times where the hits on the teacher like don't even have a sound they effect. Don't. Right. Like, and it's just like, dude, <laughs> like, ah, whoever, this this person, I, I really hope you did not pay them too much. No, like, I mean, our, and if you just asked your mom to do it, shame on you, because holy crap, dude. Our, uh, our, our uh, end of the episode sketches have better production value than this. <laughs> they <sometimes>. really do. <laughs> One hundred percent, one hundred percent. So, and then from there, it's also like it commits that sort of you know cardinal sin that movies do sometimes, especially horror films. To be honest, where you know the characters make dumb decisions, right? So the 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 one kid, so there's one kid who he's not going to stop the bludgeoning, but he is going to run outside and get help. Who's outside? Our protagonist, Frank. So Frank runs inside to like you know, do something about it, except the teacher's already dead. So his bright idea is to, like, you know, take a piece of paper that the kids have drawn on and cover her face. And then when he, like, stands up and looks around, lo and behold, his daughter's gone. So, like, you you, you gave up your daughter so you could cover this chick's face with a piece of paper? You're not smart, Frank. You're not smart. I'm sorry. Yeah. But then, you know, obviously that's sort of a plot device to get Candace into the hands of the troll kids so that they can ultimately take her back to the Soma Free Hospital, uh, which is exactly what happens. And this is sort of where everything wraps up and, you know, we get our sort of big reveal and we're going to talk right now about how effective we do or do not think that that reveal was. So... Frank returns to the hospital and he meets the doctor. Doctor explains to him that the kids, quote unquote, right, uh, are born of the mother's rage and that they're extensions of her mood so that when she's raging out and she's upset, they're overactive and they're going to kill people. Right. And when she's calm and cool and collected, uh, so are they. Which, by the way, so, just seems like mansplaining of a menstrual cycle. That's what I have here. I was like, <laughs> I feel like Cronenberg was like, <laughs> he wrote a whole movie about his wife just being pissy because she must be on her period or something. That just seems like <laughs> such a dumb movie. Yeah, no, concept. it's that. I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of, it kind of, that kind of carries over from what I was mentioning before where it's like, when you have the the recently divorced dad telling the story of the recently divorced dad, like, yeah. the mom's always going to be a crazy yeah. bitch, and the dad's always just going to be like, I don't know what happened. I was just, I was just there. Yeah. Doing, <laughs> taking care of everyone. She went crazy, right? And it's yep. like, I'm sure this dude, like, you know, was inattentive, and he, he's definitely, there are some things that he contributed, but you would never know it because, again, he's looking at this situation entirely through his own eyes, and I'm I mean, he can't help that. Who, who who else's eyes is he supposed to look at it through? But I, I don't feel like this was like Cronenberg's like reckoning. Like, let me really break this down and see where I fucked up and see what I could do better. He was just like, nope. Let me explain to the world that my ex wife's a total bitch. Here we go. Yeah, and then <laughs> right, exactly. And the more mad she gets, the more evil happens in the yeah, world. Can you believe it? No, <laughs> when she's on her period, forget it. Oh my, you don't even want to see her. She gets all worked <laughs> like, up and all bit out of shape. <laughs> and I'm the bad guy. <laughs> you know, you know, you know. Don't pretend you don't know. I know you know. Jesus Christ. <laughs> all right. So, yes, yeah, so there's definitely like. 
<laughs> that subjective recent divorcee uh, psychology viewpoint that is on full display here throughout this entire thing. Um, but regardless, it's also, you know, where for better or worse, the movie is the most interesting. So see, at, at this point in the movie, I wrote, um, how does a 90 minute movie feel so long? I, I have uh, right after that. I said, this movie feels like fishing. <laughs> really? See, I didn't think that I actually, I actually thought it was well paced. I didn't think it was particularly interesting, but that's kind of one of the things that saved it from being like Tucker and Dale in my eyes, you right. know, is that. It wasn't when, it, like, literally, we talked about when we watched that movie. Like, it felt like an hour had gone by, and it was twenty minutes in. I did not feel this way. Like but an hour a, in, okay, I felt so, like I was an hour in. But it's a Cronenberg film, so you're waiting for the fish, right? You're waiting for something big. You're waiting for that yeah. moment, or the the gotcha, or the 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 Brundle fly moment, right? Or the the yeah, fucking uh-huh. gun into the b- belly vagina that we get in video drum. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and when you're not having that and you're having these little kids in, you know, ski coats, um, you know, snow jackets, it just, and with these little tiny hammers that you and I both have admitted in our current podcast shape could take six of, um, <laughs> you know, it just feels like you're waiting for the fish on the line and, and, and you know, sure. Are you at, on the lake? Are you on a boat? Absolutely. Am I sitting there watching a cool movie? Yeah, cool. The performances, there's a lot to like about this, but it just kind of felt like fishing where yeah. it was like at a certain point, you're like, got anything yet? No. All right. You, I mean, <laughs> when do you reel it in and call I'm it? Re- I'm not ready to reel in and call it a day. Yeah, but, right. I mean, it'd be nice to catch something here. So you crack Whoa, another fishies. beer and <laughs> just keep going, I guess. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. Totally, dude. I hear you on that. And, uh, and as far as the film is concerned, you know, we've got Candace who basically is, sort of captured and she's safe because she's with the other kids and the mom isn't upset or anything. Uh, but the doctor knows where she is and he works with Frank to come up with a plan to rescue her. And that's basically that Frank is going to go in and talk to his wife, Nola and keep her calm, cool and collected while the doctor goes into where all of the brood is and rescues candy, candy short for Candace and takes her out, uh, you know, rescues her. They go away. And so this works for a minute. Basically, it works until it doesn't, right? So he goes in and he basically says like, ah, baby, I'm sorry. Let's work this all out. I always loved you, right? Like, (laughs) And she's like, do you mean it? And he's like, yeah, baby, come on. Like, it's me. And so, so, you know, again, it's working for a minute (laughs) Uh, until, you know, she basically is like, oh, really? Well, you know, since you are all about me, here's what, you know, embracing me really means. And I want to talk to you for this for a minute, Ryan. So she lifts up her dress. Oh, I can talk to you about this for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Because I, I do kind of want to, there's a couple things I wanted to ask you for your opinion on this. So she basically lifts up her dress and we see that there's basically an, an amniotic sac that instead of being inside of her belly, right, is is outside. It's 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 like a grape dangling from a vine. Yes. And it's connected to the lesions that we've seen Elsewhere on, you know, the guy, uh, the the curly haired guy. And she has a couple of like halvesies coming off too. Like they're in the process yes, of becoming yeah, more elsewhere. Of these things, right? She's growing. So, I, these so yeah, she's she's basically kind of like a like a little farm, you know, like a plant that's just growing these things off of her. And yep. each of these lesions is developing into one of these broods. So I guess I don't even. So okay, <laughs> <laughs> where do they even begin with yeah, this? Where do you right? begin with this? Right. Let me ask you this. So the doctor, let's start here. The doctor feels as though this is an unbridled success. Right. These these weird troll kids that share the demeanor uh, of of whatever uh, their their mother is actively feeling in the moment. Mwah! Good job, Doc. We need a hell of a lot <laughs> yeah, of more. Yeah, but of until these. until Why? until what? It, like, what is their function? <laughs> like, he's got the. What does he plan to do with them? Why is this working? Like, like I, I, I really don't understand how this is successful in his eyes. So, right? I think this doctor is one of the biggest problems I have with the movie because we're opens the the film opens with him being daddy, right? Like he's this, yeah. He's in control of this situation, or so we are led to believe. And he is, and you think it's a lot of like mental manipulation, right? Like you get the sense throughout the film, it alludes to the fact that he sort of gets off on being psychologically superior to his patients. Sure, is that sure. Whole thing okay, 
and I'll go down that road. But then, you know, he... So do you think this is just an experiment that he saw as a success that just got wildly out of hand? Because it was brought to his attention by Frank at one point, which is why the doctor is there with him to go get candy back from the mutant kids. Um, Frank approaches the doctor right before this scene, like, like you just described, and he's like, so all this shit's going on. And the doctor's like, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Frank's like, dude, we should go do something about that. He's like, nah, I don't think you want to do that. She gets pissed, dude. Yeah, and yeah, it's like, no, I don't when know. When were you going to like ring the bell on this and like bring some attention? Did you know they were going to murder people? And he's like, nah, I didn't know that. But uh, yeah, she gets pretty upset. She's like, you know, she gets on her period, man. And she just like goes crazy. And uh, so the doctor yeah, is so, know, man, I asked her. She's kind of funny. Yeah. You know, sorry. Right. And then we see the ultimate uh, condition that her condition is in. And it is not good. And yeah. Um, meanwhile, the doctor brings a six shot revolver into the mutant brood house and nothing else. So he fires his <laughs> load, and he is donezo, and uh, he's got nothing yeah. else to go to. It's like you knew well, so you were going the into thing. the bells of hell and fighting these mutant creatures that have killed people around your town. Come a little more strapped. I don't know. Um, <laughs> seemed a little <laughs> well, Yeah, and so here's the thing is, so, like, as, you know, as Frank's talking to the mom, and, you know, it's going well for a minute, at the same time, the doctor is, is creeping into, like you say, the, the brood house, let's call it, or whatever. And he gets Candace, and he's he's trying to sneak out. It's at that moment that, that Nola does the reveal. Now, not only does she reveal this amniotic sac, but she then proceeds to tear it open... And there's a lot of heavy, viscous blood in there. Uh, Pulls out, you know, the baby and then begins to lick the blood off of its head very much in a sort of animalistic fashion, right? Like a cat or a cow would, right? Um, She bites the sack open at one point. Yeah, yeah. So it's it it, it, that's definitely where you get your sort of you know gruesome horror elements. Uh, Yeah, it's not it's not torture (laughs) porn, but it's definitely grotesque. But but again, but I I I don't. I really don't know what the point, like, what does that successful experiment look like? Like, is it to be able to mass produce kids? Because, I mean, she's a woman. She can birth a kid naturally, and it's not going to come out as this fucked up weird troll kid, right? So, basically, the only thing that's different is that she can have many kids much more quickly, yeah, you can just grow them. And, but they're, <laughs> but they've, they've regressed in terms of, They're not self-sufficient functioning. Now, if you had told me, for example, just spitballing here, you know, just like if you had told me that it was some part of some, you know, so this doctor has fucking worldwide ambitions where, you know, he's a crazy mad scientist and he wants to take over the world. So he's basically going to grow this giant brood army off this chick. And once he's amassed an army of a thousand, he's going to piss her off or keep her tortured. So she's fully angry and stays angry so that the kids are all pissed off and they go on this massive slaughter tour. Right. Okay. I can get behind that. Like stupid or not, whatever. It's a reason why you did this thing. I can I can wrap my head around that. I At no point do I understand what the point of any of this was. Correct. Uh, that's my point. I don't know what any of this is. What the fuck is this? Yeah, like it's just yeah. nobody has any motivations. And the people that do have motivations, i.e. Frank looking after his daughter, completely botched those. So I'm just left with nothing. And I, I mean, at yeah. least... So this this makes me go back to the last time we watched a movie like this uh, was The Void uh, a few weeks back. Okay. And yeah, yeah, yeah. at least that doctor, we were given some motivating factor, like right, right, like he lost his daughter and he's trying to recreate that by you know getting a possession uh, of so, like a demonic possession into a new pregnancy a la Rosemary's baby kind of thing. Right. So there was at least, and there's like the portal of hell and the whole bit, but they at least tried, like they threw up and made par to, to try to laid up and made par to try to uh, give us some contingent of a, a plot device. This had nothing. I don't really know what the doctor was going for. We don't even know if it was a drug or a psychotropic or like some kind of, um, you know, it's like uh, like a therapy device. All we're ever shown is that he's just talking to them and they're calling him daddy. Uh, but we don't really know what the process is. So 
then you unwind. So if you're not going to give me that, then it goes back to your point, which is then it just becomes this bitch. Like, look at this bit. You know, it just becomes. So <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Right. Right, guys. You know. <laughs> yeah. See what she's doing with the stuff. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. what? Wait, I'm just what? trying to be a good dad. And this chick's going all crazy on me. Yeah. Got a whole army against me. I don't know what to tell Out you. Out there having kids with who knows who else? Who knows where these other kids came from? I know. Right. So, yeah. So now, you know, because obviously Frank is reviled by this reveal, she basically is like, oh, you were bullshitting me the whole time. Fuck you. Uh, yeah, you'll you'll never take Candace alive or dead. And then so she gets upset, and then as a result, all of Which, the, by the way, children get that, upset. That whole thing felt like... Uh, the more you get into this, the more I'm like really siding with you <laughs> on this divorce thing because she goes into this wild tangent out of nowhere where she's like, I know when you're lying. You're lying to me. You always lie. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, he has totally had this conversation in real life before. <laughs> One hundred percent, man. Yeah. I mean, in all fairness, I've had that conversation in life before, so I get it. I just didn't write a movie about it. <laughs> yeah. So, but like I said, dude, you know, I mean, even because she does get to be, or she is the crazy bitch, like she at least gets the meteor role. She like does? I said, for for as you know, quote unquote, horrible as I was supposed to think she was, like she was by far and away the most interesting character in the entire Absolutely. thing. And, right. and then she was also just, you know, outside of that, she was also probably the best actress. Like I think just inherently she was a better actress than he was an actor. So there's that aspect of it as well. But, um, but yeah, it's definitely a, uh, a one-sided view of uh, <laughs> the nature of divorce. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, and then with her being upset, the brood children end up turning on the doctor who was able to at least set down Candace and tell her to, you know, run outside before she gets attacked. There's a brief moment where they're finished with the doctor, the brood children turn on Candace and the dad sort of knows that. And so again, just keeping it. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. Dude wrote a script where he saves his kid by strangling his ex-wife. <laughs> oh my oh god. Man. <laughs> this is like a, this is a divorce guy fantasy fucking 101 horror script. It scripts. really is by the numbers. Jesus Christ. It really is. <laughs> oh man. So uh <laughs> So, yeah, I don't know if that was as therapeutic to us as an audience as it was to I mean, uh, Mr. Cronenberg. It was that, awkward that for me. I don't know about you because there was no like... twist. There was no <laughs> she didn't come back. She wasn't possessed. Uh, he just chokes her out and then leaves. Her there. And I'm like, whoa, OK, cool. The end. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, he does that. He ends up, you know, by strangling her, he ends up killing the brood because, uh, you know, you kill the queen ant, the rest die, and that whole thing. And so we do get a sort of, you know, twilight zony, twisty little ending where he ends up saving his daughter, puts her in the car, they're driving back home, and then we get the slow zoom into the daughter's skin, revealing that she has a couple lesions much like the uh, mother had. So, so how'd she get those? Are they contagious? I thought it was through I, the psycho, whatever the fuck it was that, that the mother dude. was getting that. <laughs> yeah, it is. I've, I've told you this before, dude. Like there, I think there are certain films. What was it? I, I remember we had a discussion. I think it was Swiss army man, like way back, like third episode of episode of season one. Um, about when, when filmmakers will do that sometimes where they, they tack on like something at the end that they want to be like either profound or what have you. And it w kind of works in the moment as like, uh, like, you know, the end dot, dot question mark. Right. But when you really, but then you start to break it down, you know, like we do on this show where it's our job to break these things down and look at them closely and it's like, wait a minute. That doesn't actually really tie into anything. Like, if anything, it just presents a series of problems like we're talking <laughs> right. about right now, right? Yeah. Right. Um, so, you know, you, you get that. I feel like that's one of those, uh, you know, uh, uh, stealing from Peter to pay Paul, like like the short term move at the expense of the lot at the long term. So like short term, like you gave me that like, ah, ha, ha, cool. What if? 
And then I had a minute to think about it. I was like, wait a minute. Let's go back to that. Hold on. <laughs> yeah, but then when I turn around to ask Cronenberg that, he's already got my 10 bucks and he's run off. <laughs> Later, bitches. Like, You'll never catch me. <laughs> <laughs> my ex wife scrapes me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, man, that is the final shot of David Cronenberg's <laughs> <laughs> The Brood. Ryan. Three adjectives. We do it every episode. What you got? Uh, We're just going to make this brief, dude. Boring, poorly paced, and better things to come. Because uh, I do. Wow. I, dude, I don't mean to shit on Crohn's. Uh, he's, he's my dude. I <laughs> Crony, like this guy. baby, I love you. I was embarrassed that I hadn't seen this yet. Um, you know, because I do love me a good Cronenberg film. I've seen most of them. We've talked about it. Uh, yeah. But you know, this one was one that has just kept slipping by me. And now I'm okay with it because I was able to see the best of what he had and uh, judge him by that. And then, you know, go back and kind of tack this one on later and say, well, you know, he was learning things and I get that. I will uh, add real quick though, that uh, the eighties taught us, uh, you know, one thing that kept coming to my mind is that there's nothing scarier than white children, right? Like that was the whole thing back then. Serious dude. Poltergeist and Omen, children of the corn. Now this, it was always these like really pale white blonde yeah. kids that were uh, toe headed white kids. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not the omen. I guess he was Damien, but still white kids, man. <laughs> keep, keep away from them white kids. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. For me, uh, I've got flat. I thought, I thought it was just, uh, you know, again, just uh, cruising at five the entire time. Even these, you know, death scenes and whatnot. Uh, cold, and that doesn't just apply to the fact that it was shot entirely in Canada with a shitload of snow everywhere, but it was just very detached, aloof. Like I didn't, I wasn't invested in the characters. I wasn't invested in Frank. Yeah, I didn't give a shit about the, any of these know, people. Yeah, exactly. Not even the daughter. Um, you know, like there was never really any pathos where I was like, oh, I hope she gets out okay. Yeah, nah. even her. Like there should be built-in pathos. Yeah, no. And then, uh, vi- <laughs> <laughs> and then I have visual mixed bag. Those are all hyphenated, of course, because it's it's one word. And uh, again, because I really did think it was interesting to see a lot of the color schemes and, and see how bright and vibrant a lot of this was and some of the cool, like I said, blue from the exteriors and whatnot. But then just, you know, the, the death scenes would be really sort of statically shot, you know, as a lot of like wide shots with just, you know, that brief insert close up of the hammer coming down and, you know, then we just sort of see the aftermath. I'm look, dude, I get that dude didn't have much of a budget to work with and, you know, I'm sure these days for the same budget he could have made it a lot more interesting. But yeah. You know, all we can all we can do is judge a film for, for what it is as we're watching it here and now and you know, that's what we did. So uh same dude by the way, cold, same DP visual Mark mixed Irwin bag. that shot video drone with the fly uh, we talked about this on the video drum episode. This is the guy that went on to go do all the nineties comedies like dumb and dumber and old school, et cetera, et cetera. This guy shot all the nineties comedies uh, that you could think of all the American pie movies, like all the way up to black Jesus on comedy central, the TV series. So, um, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. He made a, a dramatic shift, but he was, uh, he's, Cro- he used to be Cronenberg's dude and, um, and Howard Shore and all that. So you get the whole team here. Um, it just kind of, a uh, you know, a lackluster product at the end compared to what we're used to getting from them too. And that's the thing, you know, if this was like, you know, an old USA up all night movie or like toxic Avenger or trauma film or something, I might actually find a sweet spot in my heart for this in some way, shape or form. I think I'm, I'm judging it unfairly because it's Cronenberg. I hate to say it, but that's kind of the deal here. No, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, listeners, as you know, we do the uh, star ratings on my end and the grade ratings on Ryan's end. Ryan, give us your formal grade rating for The Brood. I'm giving this a D plus for David. <laughs> <laughs> nice, man. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I've got my star rating as uh, two and three quarters. Uh, and that's just strictly because of the fact that yeah, I could easily go down to two and a half. But uh, it wasn't it wasn't one of those. I think just because it was well paced, you know, I didn't find myself just like constantly wanting to like check my phone and pause the movie and get up and go do something. Oh, I was see, like, I'm just the opposite. I thought this was poorly paced. I, that's the one thing really? I will disagree with you on. Yeah. Huh? No, I thought, I thought, I thought it was uninteresting from a story perspective, but I thought, 
again, it at least moved along at a... De- I mean, it's not it's not a fast film. It's not a high-paced film, but it moved along at a decent enough clip, and I can't think of one scene where it was like, oh, my God, come on, let's go already. I guess you It was more right. just like, eh, Maybe it just said it wasn't right. engaging then. Eh, Maybe the characters eh. weren't uh, yeah, engaging. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. The characters weren't engaging. The story wasn't engaging, but I think the pacing was, was actually pretty decent. So, um, so yeah, so I'm going to give it... One thing we didn't talk about. How about the... Yeah, uh, like, did, did you happen to notice the... Um, the, the the corpse tape the, the on the ground when when the guy goes back to visit where the woman died <laughs> and they had it all taped yes. off where the woman was with white masking tape for some reason the <laughs> chalk out, the yeah. proverbial chalk outline of sorts and uh it looked like the like the uh the little um uh, stick figure that's on the walking sign on the street uh, you know street <laughs> lights you know i don't know no, totally. It looks so it's also super funny that there was like no no police tape or anything anywhere else. Just this random like taping of a, a body yeah. on the ground. Like, yeah, and it's it was still like there for some reason. <laughs> it was the best. <laughs> and there's no and blood worst anywhere. Job. It's simultaneously it's immaculate. The floor. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I think it would have been much more effective if you would have shown like blood stains on the floor or something like that. Like, it's oh, that's what she died. Dude, yeah. But yeah, that yeah, was yeah. like no, it but. seemed like very Leslie Nielsen naked gun from the files of police squad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dumb and Dumber, Jim Carrey laying on the tarmac yeah. after he drops out. <laughs> yeah, totally. So uh, D plus from Ryan, two and three quarter stars from Jason for David Cronenberg's The Brood. Now, hopefully, you guys enjoyed this discussion here. I uh, wanted to let you guys know a couple ways that you can get us at us. We do have the socials and we've got the email. So we are on Twitter and Instagram at Esoterica Cinema. Ryan is the Ryan Siebold and Ryan underscore Siebold on Twitter and Instagram, respectively. I am Jason Aberrant, 1B2Rs on both the Instagram and Twitter. And aside from that, uh, again, we do have the email, esotericacinema at gmail.com. I know a lot of you have some fire takes on muffins that you're eating right now, and you need to tell someone about it. You can email us all about your delicious lemon muffin, chocolate muffin, blueberry muffin. Now, if you want to, you can also talk to us about film-related things. I suppose we can have similar Or just uh, write in and tell us how your ex-wife's a bitch. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know how she's causing all the problems in your life and like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. Or yeah, any reason you want to and and specifically, we would like for you guys to reach out and let us know what you think about the show. Right. If there's anything that you'd like to see us do more or less of, if you want to contribute to, uh, suggesting some films for our season three master list, you know, for any and all of those reasons, go ahead and reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. So with that said, Ryan, Oh, you know what? Let me just drop real quick, too. If you haven't been to the website yet, get your ass over to the website. It's dope. Esotericacinema.com. Very easy. <laughs> Esotericacinema.com. That's Where's right. That? It's at the dot <laughs> com. It's at the dot com uh, I, think I, have to say it, I think I have to say it three times in 30 seconds, according to the uh, copywriting manual. So once again, Esotericacinema.com. Check it out. Uh, we do have a lot of fun stuff on there, not the least of which is the master list. That we're always pulling from at the end of the episodes. So if you want to see what the movies are on there that we have to choose from and follow along when we pull these at the end of the episode, you can go right there to the website, download it. It'll be on the front page along with a bunch of other fun stuff. So Ryan, it's that time. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and pull our next film. As always, we're going to random.org for their true number generator. We are plugging in. 1 through 200, and we are letting it spit back a number. Now, right now, I have just gotten 26. So for everybody at home that actually has downloaded the list, go ahead and pull it up and find 26. What you're going to do is by now, you've noticed that under number 26, we have Ryan, a film... I want to say this is a Michael Haneke film, and I do not believe I have ever seen it. It is called Cash. C-A-C-H-E. Want to go ahead and uh, hit us up with a description on that? All right, Jason from 2005. Yes, uh, this is a Michael Haneke film. It's uh, cash or cachet. That's always the uh, topic of contention, right? Is it cash, cachet? Um, yeah, I go with cash personally, obviously, yeah. based on how I intro it. You know, bokeh, bokeh. It's just uh, one of those words. <laughs> uh <laughs> IMDb has this as, without warning, happy, successful Parisian couple Georges and Anne Laurent 
played by Juliette ben, uh, Bonoche and Danielle Atier, uh, receive anonymous videos suggesting that they are being stalked. The tapes are followed dis- by disturbingly violent, if childish, drawings. George, a well-known literary talk show host, shrugs off the mysterious messages, but Anne grows increasingly distressed and fearful for their teenage son. She grows to suspect that an incident in George's past is behind the increasing torment. So, dun, dun, dun. Yes, this is a French film. Box office uh, 16 mil. We'll see how nice, it goes. Dude. Yeah. Yep. I do remember this uh, box art now that I'm seeing this on the old interwebs here. So this is something that uh, I have seen before without seeing before. So Excellent. Yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to it, man. And yeah, I, I really need to watch a lot more Michael Haneek films. Like he's a, I've seen Funny Games. I think I've seen maybe one more of his films aside from that one. Dude, Funny Games, obviously. Movie. Yeah, really, really interesting film. That we might even have it on our list, I think. I think we have it on our list. But uh, It was cool he got to go back and make uh, the English version as well. Usually when you get an English version. I need to watch that one. Oh, you yeah, didn't see that one? Of those... those... I, so I didn't. So here's the thing, man. For me, it's one of those things where it's like, look, the the original film it, it's it's the exact same film it's like it's like where he like remade his own film in exactly the same style right. so the only thing i'm going to get out of it is i'm going to be able to experience it without having to read subtitles now i'm not someone that hates subtitles but there is a part of me that wonders if the experience would be different just being able to to hear and see everything without having to read but at the same time it feels unnecessary and i feel like if i watch it I'm I'm giving it credence for existing when maybe I shouldn't. I don't know. You've seen it. What do you think? <laughs> That's fair. I like them both. I mean, you've seen it. Yeah. Did yeah. you did you like one over the other? I don't remember. Um, I remember liking them both. I don't remember compare or contrast which I because they were both pretty long time ago. So, got you. Cool. So, uh, yeah, listeners, that wraps up our conversation for the brood. Be sure to go ahead and watch the 2005 film Cash or Cache, depending on which persuasion you are. And we will see you on the next episode of Esoterica Cinema. Stick around for a fake commercial. As a suburban middle class husband and father of two, your life has been filled with moments of wonder and excitement, like the time you picked up dinner from Olive Garden and they gave you an extra entree without charging. You felt kind of bad for the person who got screwed out of their meal, but you also understand that the nature of the universe is transactional, and they'll make it up elsewhere. But at the same time, your life has been full of tragedy and setbacks, like the time you had a family vacation planned for Cabo, but then your best friend called in the middle of a horrific bout of vomiting. He mentioned something about bad sushi from a condemned spot in the valley that used to sell you guys beer as teenagers. And then three days later, you found out he had sex with your wife. It's all left you to wonder if you're even any good. Maybe you'd be doing yourself a huge favor by securing an overly large ball and chain to your ankle and going for a swim in a deep river. Sure, it likely prove restrictive as you drag it across the pavement en route to your destination, but what's to stop you from picking it up and carrying it around with you to different places? You'd probably even lose a few pounds while you were at it. That'd be nice. Hi, I'm Dr. Hal Raglan of the Soma Free Institute, and I've dedicated my life's research to the development of a powerful new breakthrough therapy I call Psychoplasmics. Psychoplasmics gives middle-aged men of both married and divorced stature a new sense of passion and excitement, invigorating even the most apathetic of what suburbia has to offer. And how does it do this, you ask? By not asking too many questions, that's how. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's therapy. Maybe it's early-onset psychosis inspired by the nefarious writings of a crazed madman. Who's to say? The only thing that matters is that all of my patients leave Soma free with incredibly powerful erections. So if you're a middle-aged man suffering from the doldrums of suburban life, come see me and my team at our facilities at UC Santa Monica State, in a building I lovingly refer to as the Erectoral College. Psychoplasmics. Who cares how it works? Your dick's hard.
From the imagination of acclaimed author Ashton McCauley comes the next great American anti-hero, Nick Ventner in Whiteout. Nick is a bit of a lush, preferring whiskey to water and bar hopping to exercise. But when a mysterious benefactor hires Nick to find the lost gates of Shangri-La, Nick sobers up just enough to take on the case. Featuring non-stop action and a hilarious wit, Whiteout by Ashton McCauley is a -a laugh-a-minute thrill ride that will keep you turning the pages until the very end. Whiteout, available now in ebook, hardcover, and paperback versions, online and everywhere books are sold. Published by Aberrant Literature.